two conferences walk into Columbus, Ohio. Only one will exit. Welcome in to our penultimate episode of Six Rotations here, a final four edition alongside Mick Haley. I'm Daniel Gilman. So happy to be with you and so happy as always to be sponsored by SNA Sports. If you want to be a sponsor for next season, reach out to us. Send us an email, gilmandaniel at gmail.com, or just DM us on Twitter. Always open to adding to our arsenal. But Mick, I'm going to let you cook this episode. I've gotten calls. People want to hear more, Mick. Let's, let's open the stage. The four teams are set. It's an ACC Big Ten challenge. I, I cannot wait for Thursday night. We're going to have to fill the days up until then you know, with something. So why not make it, you know, Mick Haley breaking it down. You were in Austin. So let's start there. Nebraska, the only non-top four seed to advance to the final four this season. If you haven't seen, let's just put it up there for you. 7 p.m. Eastern Thursday, Wisconsin, Louisville, one versus four. And then 9.30 Eastern or whenever, you know, 30 minutes after that first one finishes, Nebraska, Pittsburgh, three versus 10 at the Nationwide Arena in Columbus. You'll be there, but let's rewind it to that, that incredible Incredible. Maybe the match of the weekend in the, all the regionals with Nebraska and, uh, and their incredible showing. I have to tell you, if the Nebraska fans were angry with me earlier, they'll like me today because uh, I, we've seen a lot of excellent volleyball this year. But the coaching job that Nebraska's staff did with the team that they had was absolutely one of the finest ever. Uh, The players were so prepared and so focused uh, and the staff knew exactly uh, everyone on the staff was doing something and it was independent of the head coach. The head coach was kind of managing this whole thing, but he had it set up so that everybody on the court had a coach. And everybody knew their responsibility. And it was so fun to watch from a coaching standpoint. Uh, Texas, on the other hand, did a pretty good job, uh, both, both matches, at changing their rotations to match up, uh, which is something we haven't seen a lot of this year. The coaches haven't used a lot of the matchups. But this, this, this game had a lot of things. Nebraska won out because they continued to, to go. And and I thought their setter was quoted. Did you, did you see this quote by the setter? She said, Nicklin uh, Haynes, Nicklin Haynes. Yeah. She was so good. Nicklin says we out hearted them and we out schemed them. And that is absolutely true right down to the industry and both setters for both teams. This was such a tense match. Both setters were just hanging on by a thread, trying to execute perfectly so their hitters would have the best advantage. And it was such a fun match to watch that. Now, You're getting emotional. Well, I am. Think it, was, it really was. It was poetry in motion to see the star of a team over the last three years, not even really, no, not playing. A lot of volleyball, you know, newcomers or novices would be like, oh, why isn't Lexi Sun playing? And then you could see the combination of Batenhorst and Krause, and you you understand why Cook had to make that call midway through the year. And then Sun got some starts late in the year, and we've gotten some flack for talking about her. But Batenhorst and Krause, 28 kills, four errors, 50 four swings. That's a 450 hitting percentage for the yeah. two freshmen in the biggest stage in the loudest gym with they cubic hitting zero. And they didn't get the best sets because the, the pressure was so on these setters was they were just really working so hard to get the ball out there and to have that 54 swings, like you said, and only four errors by the two freshmen is phenomenal. Now, having said that, now the, now the Nebraska fans will get angry with me that I don't know if they can reproduce that. Uh, Nebraska only hit 259, and they're going to play a pit team that also, remember, had one of the best performances ever by member 
Manet. Yep. Yep. That, Lecater, I mean, she she, she was... took over the match for Pittsburgh, 47 swings, 21 kills, and only three errors. And she was responsible for 25 and a half points in that match. It was, I mean, all right, let's let's move over and talk about it now. After, you know, Nebraska, Texas, you know, it was it was Nebraska easy through two. Texas ended up getting the third, which made things very tight late night on Saturday. But Nebraska finished strong with the 25-21 fourth set win. Let's go back in time to the first match of the day. It was uh it was a showing from a player who is 5'8 that we have talked about in the past. And we, and we constantly say, remember Manet, you know, you remember her from Missouri and, and she didn't do that much. She battled injuries. Purdue couldn't stop her. And her block was incredible. It was Purdue did win the second set 30, 28. Then it was a route 25, 20, 25, 15 hats off to a, a Kayla Lund performance. That was admirable because I don't know how healthy Kayla Lund is, right? She, she sat at the end of the season. She's been playing half, you know, 50% capacity in the postseason. She went 5 8 26, but the stats don't tell it. She was out there nittying and grittying her team. Fairbanks hits 471. The setter turned outside. And Serena Gray, I mean, perfect. 14 0 24 before we talk about Manet, who, who took 21 or 47 swings for 21 kills and three errors for a uh, Lecator member Manet with nine digs and two blocks. Wow. I, I could, I could see Nebraska getting into the finals, but I can't see them winning. Uh, and I could see Pittsburgh. Of course getting not. You just had to stick that in there, right? For, for yeah. Oscar nation. Yeah. yeah. I, I can see Pittsburgh getting in there, but neither of these teams I think no. can win. So the real, the real match to watch probably is going to be Louisville who who unbelievably withstood Georgia Tech's Brambia. I mean she got 70 sets. 70 sets. She did. And and I would say 20 from the back row. Yeah. Yeah. She it was I mean it was Brambia versus Louisville. And De Beer wasn't good in the first two sets. And man, did she pick it up in three and four. Unbelievable. So but hold on, much- let's fill this in for those that may not have, have watched it. Louisville won the first set 25-18. It was it was kind of smooth sailing, a big effort early on from Chasse. She finished hitting 350. But Georgia Tech, maybe the best set of their season in that second set. They had lost all six sets against Louisville this year. They win the second set 25-21. Third and fourth are tight, and they're Anna Stevenson's Picasso. I mean, what she did, Mick, in those third and fourth sets was unstoppable. She had one set with six blocks in the one set. She finished with 10 blocks, 13 kills. Yeah. Is she the best middle in the country, you think? Yeah, well, uh, Stevenson is close to the best middle in the country, but Serena Gray would tell you not uh, after that performance. And uh, so I I think she's right up there. Plus we got Dana Redke to talk about still. And you got Redke, but if you're Karch Karai, you're you're probably having to wipe the drool off your mouth because I mean, there are some kids that have athleticism that get in that international play will absolutely get way better. And, and these kids are athletic and very, very good right now. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I think Stevenson's right up there with Red Key in that group. If I was doing the All-American Committee, I would have a hard time right now. It's going to be tough. Yeah, let's give a little bit of credit to some of the uh, some of the players that, that that played their final their final match, like Caitlin Newton and Jenna Otek, where, yeah. where, you know, they put it all on the line out there for Purdue. It's, it's unfortunate. That, that they still can't get over that hump, you know, zero final four appearances for the Boilermakers in their program's history, which is just one of those, just one of those things that it's hard to get by. And then it, for Brambia, I, I believe she has one more season. She's listed as a senior. She started in 2018, wow. 2019, 2020, 2021. So she's played four years, including the COVID year. So if she wants to, I think she'll have one more. I am, let's put, let's get a GoFundMe starting for Madi Brambia to come back and also for the broadcasters to say her name right. Cause we had to make sure with Madi before we interviewed her. And uh, it's, it's almost like the guy's doing that call. And, and I know uh, Katie George is from middle America, Kentucky, and they don't really roll their L's or their N's, but they were struggling with Brambilla, Bram, Brambilla, Bram, Brambabilla. It was, it was certainly funny to see. Um, well, I can't laugh at that because I have the same oh, trouble with all these names. We so can I, laugh I at ourselves to, sometimes too. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's a broadcasting so, thing. 
so you ahead. know there just there were just so many very individual and great performances uh, team wise and from individuals people stepped up uh i just i just can't tell you how much fun collegiate women's volleyball is right now at this point maybe the greatest time in the history of the game so far for the level of play and the effort by the individuals and if you didn't plan to go to columbus and you can get tickets you ought to go because you you're going to see some outstanding coaching by the coaches the coaches have done just a wonderful job uh, to get these four teams there. I, I think these coaches have been terrific. Um, and the things they're doing during the season and the changes they've made are historic because they've taken chances. Um, they've challenged the system a bit and they're still in control of their teams. And uh, wow, it's going to be fun. So I, I was uh, just really, really excited about everybody here. Can I go back to the Texas match? Yeah, go ahead. Nebraska, because there's something that happened in that match that kind of ruined the match. Uh, but it, it's fourth game. Uh, Nebraska's ahead 14 to 12. Coach Elliott has a choice. They're starting, they've just run two points, but he's got a he's got an automatic timeout at 15. Yep. But he chose to call a timeout at 14. They come out of the timeout, boom, Nebraska gets the next two points. Now he's got to call another timeout. Now he's had to use both of his timeouts. They, they come back, they side out only with, a, with a, one of the jams that you've been seeing, yep. only to get called now at this point. There have been no, realize there have been no calls on any what we call open hand tip, but these aren't tips. These yeah, are the, what was it? The lift call? Is that what they? The, the, yeah, they the, called they called that, but but so inappropriate it ruined the match at that point because now Texas was virtually out of it. They were down twelve to seventeen, and disheartened by the call. Besides, and it, it was so unfortunate because I think they might have been able to battle back uh, because they had everything going for them. So the point is. I think we ought to eliminate this jam play in volleyball because it's so hard, one, to call, and two, to defend. And three, if we had NBA or WNBA players, they could just come in and throw the ball like that because they jump so high and they would probably be successful right away. So uh, that that's a point that I, I wanted to get out on the broadcast because I really think Coaches have to think about this and people have to think about this, not to let it ruin our game. That was one of the best sporting events I have ever attended. And for Nebraska to take out that entire Gregory gym and the Texas crowd, you have to take your hats off to them because they never flinched when the crowd went nuts. Washington flinched when Washington was ahead and the crowd got Texas back into it. Washington went, whoa. Nebraska. What about, what percentage was Nebraska fans? Would you say ten? I would say Less? five. five? I would say five percent. I I don't know what they couldn't get tickets or they didn't travel, but they were spread all over, and each one had a sign, and they were kind of looking at each other and trying to get their mojo going. But it. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I did want to mention, I mean, there are a ton of, of, of players in the transfer portal already. We talked about Annie Kate Fitzpatrick. Caitlin Horde is the queen of the jam, right? Because her arm, you know, wingspan, the, the Penn State middle, she's yeah. in the transfer portal. So that's going to be interesting no, to keep kidding. an eye on. Yeah, it's I didn't know an that exodus, an exodus from uh, from state college for some reason. But um, no, that's an interesting. I mean, you say it's unfortunate, unfortunate for for Texas. It's that, that, that decision. I think the, the coach's time out there is, is certainly the questionable call at 14, 12, because you play on and if you, you either win a couple points or the next point is going to be a media timeout. And by calling your own timeout, you eliminate the media timeout. So instead of having an extra timeout, Elliot eliminates it, limits himself to just two timeouts. That's always something interesting. Um, to look at when you have to manage the media timeouts. You see it a lot in basketball as well. But let's get to the final one, Mick. We only have a couple minutes here to kind of go over this, this last one. And, and I, I love this stat here. Now, it was the only three-setter, but it was, it was a fun match. Uh, Wisconsin battled in the second set 
to avoid splitting the first two with Minnesota. It was 25-18, 26-24, almost single-handedly after seeing Samity struggle in, in the first match and Miyabe step up. It was, it was a little bit more of the, the let's rely on Samity there in that second set where she, she did finish with 12 kills. Karai loved her, right? You know, watching, getting to watch Karch Karai back calling matches made me miss him back in April because it's just fun. It's fun to hear someone who makes the decisions at the top level get to add his input. And so he said, having Samity come back was a questionable decision for him when he saw the decision that she made to go another year. And he is so happy she did because of the growth and now Samity can step up in the, in the A team, hopefully. But look at this stat here. Minnesota never lost a match against Wisconsin from 2015 to 2018. They were 8-0 in those four years. Now that lines up with the career of Samantha Seliger-Swenson, who never lost against Wisconsin. Since Seliger-Swenson retired or graduated, Wisconsin's now 6-0 against Minnesota. Well, that, that tells you something, but it's usually a combination of players also. No, and, I just thought uh, that was a fascinating one because yeah, Minnesota, yeah. Shaftmaster is great, but they, they had that trouble in between the Swenson and Shaftmaster era trying to find that pure setter. And in this match, it just felt like next year, Shaftmaster will be able to, you know, get, get past that hump and, you know, obviously saying goodbye to Barnes and Hilly and Retke and, 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 and all the Loberg and everything will help as well. Well, I, I, two things. I get tickled at Karch when he announces because he knows who he wants on the national team. Yep. And man, he's the best salesman on the air. You've got it. So all the coaches would be mad if it was a college coach recruiting like that. But it's a national team coach. He can recruit. Especially uh, nobody... with a gold medal with a gold medal around his neck. Exactly. Exactly. Wants. So, so that was funny. I, I got a kick out of that. Uh, the other thing, though, is who's going to win between Wisconsin and Louisville? That's the match. I mean, that's the one we can do a little bit of previewing right now. That's it, it's you're going to ask 50 volleyball fanatics and 48 of them will say the champion is probably going to come out of the left side of the bracket. Oh, I have no idea. I'm just happy. It's the early match. So it's, let me, you know, let there's me no, give you no what, delaying. Go ahead. Let me tell you what the numbers say um, with these two playing Wisconsin and Louisville, Wisconsin averaged 18.6 kills, 18.6 points per set. Louisville averaged 18.3. Wisconsin had a 1.60 differential. That's your what you hit during the season and what you held your opponents to. Guess what Louisville's was? 160. Absolutely the yeah. same. Wow. And the RPI was Louisville 1 and Wisconsin 4. Don't think the RPI has anything to do with the numbers, but this is going to be a game. And yeah. Uh, you know, Chauncey was almost uh, perfect in the match uh, against Georgia Tech. She, she had no hitting errors up until I think the third third set, and uh, she only ended up with two. She's so, uh, they're she so pure. Perform, it's yeah, yeah, she can perform like that. And then then they've got it. What what happened to Iko Jones? She didn't show up for the match. No, she, I, I think she had a ball that took two or three <laughs> spectators out of the stands. I've not seen that in a long time. I, I it feels like there's certain game plans and, and that game plan for Georgia Tech was to try to eliminate Iko Jones. That's what it well, seemed to me. And they did a good job. He was job eliminated. At it. Yeah. But let's look at the setter matchup, right? I mean, you got Dilfer and Hilly. In my yeah. opinion, this is the setter of the year conversation, right? I know Nicklin Hames has been phenomenal, but the pieces around for what Dilfer has done, and obviously everyone's going to talk about how Hilly is, is probably going to win for, for national, you know, it's, it's just all oh, salivating to think about what this battle can be a reminder that this is the first game. So 7 PM Eastern on Thursday, and then you've got the reuniting, the reuniting of member Manet and Kathy who played together at Missouri. And they are going to match up on the other side of the nets. And you know that member Manet is going to be used as a focal point of Pittsburgh's offense because Ende only took about 18 swings in that regional final. I'm not sure what the game plan will be for Dan Fisher, but you've got three lethal assassins right now on that side with Serena Gray in the middle. See, if Lund can't score, though, 
if if Londa's hurt to the point she can't score, and you were right, she she was doing all the leadership out there, but she could not score. And the setter kept going back to her, and I kept saying, "Oh my goodness, you're just asking this kid yep. to do miracles." A lot of down yeah. balls, though. She wasn't. She was making smart smart swings. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I think Nebraska maybe has a shot with all the freshmen. But then you got Pittsburgh's freshman setter that not only set but Maddie, she hit. Yeah. You know, and and you got Stevenson uh, and Redke going on the other side against each other off of the one foot. How good is that? I mean, there are so many angles to watch this tournament on. It's just amazing to me. It, what's crazy, too, is you've got Fairbanks, who is a setter. You're talking about she hits, but she's I, she almost seems like more of a hitter to me. She's been more of a hitter in the postseason. And then uh, Akeo is the one that, that you're mentioning. That's just the pure setter. She picks up digs as well. I, there, there's going to be a lot of offense. That's the one thing. Lexi Rodriguez is insane. And uh, I'm blanking on the freshman libero for Louisville right now. She's having, you know, the, the assumption grad, she's having a season to remember. So you're talking about two of the best liberos in the country that are both freshmen. Um, Elena Scott, that's her name. And so with Scott and Rodriguez, both in, in a potential matchup, I, I'm giving the nod to Nebraska. I think we're going to get, an all red championship here. I, I don't know. I don't know what to say for was, uh, Wisconsin, I, Wisconsin in four. That's going to be, I'm going to say Wisconsin, Nebraska, big 10 championship. That's, that's my call. Let's hear Well, it. I don't know if I can go with that. Uh, but if you're going to do that, I'll do Pittsburgh and Louisville and we'll, we'll An see ACC championship. Yeah. Okay. There we go. I love it. I love it. All right, guys. We're so happy that you were able to jump on with us all season long. We're going to have one final episode breaking it all down once everything is said and done. Our end of the season awards from Mick and I. I want to give a huge congratulations to UNLV, who swept Valparaiso to win the NIVC, which is a big deal because Georgia Tech won it the last time, which was 2019. Look at Georgia Tech playing in the regional finals, winning a set against the number one team in the nation. So keep an eye on the running Rebels, Mariana Hayden, I think was named MVP of that. If there was an award, she's been so good this season. I think she had double digit kills and hit over 300. So we're going to check in with you guys over the weekend. Thank you so much for joining us for Mick. I'm Daniel. This is six rotations. 